Hello, my name is Brian Shanker and today we're going to talk a little bit about the spleen. Our objectives today for the spleen are to explain the function, evaluate the location and the size, identify the vascular supply of the spleen, state the protocol required by the AIUM, American Institute of Ultrasound and Medicine, and as well identify some common pathology seen within the spleen. Function. Two of the main functions for the spleen are defense and erythropoiesis. Defense, this all starts within the white pulp of the spleen. That's where the lymphocytes develop. Some of its protection wanes in adulthood, but this is critical because this is where the lymphocytes are produced and it protects children against infection. And again, this wanes in adulthood, but it remains relevant throughout life. Removal of the spleen is also contraindicated in children less than three years old. And it's because of the unique functions of the spleen why it is contraindicated. Uh, again, it forms the lymphocytes there, macrophages, antibodies, so it, it's a critical source to fight uh, infection and uh, protect your immune system. Erythropoiesis. Now, erythropoiesis begins at about the fifth to sixth month of fetal development. This is very important as well because later in life, the bone marrow does uh, take place of the uh, red blood cell manufacturing, but should the bone marrow be compromised, the spleen would then again regain its function of producing red blood cells, and it can regain this function any time throughout life. A couple other important functions of the spleen, culling. Now this is removal of defective cells from the system. So let's say you have some sickle cells or some spherocytes that are trying to pass through the sinus walls. Well, because of their shape, they don't have the typical bioconcave shape that a normal red blood cell has. So these spherocytes or sickle cells get caught in these sinus walls and they are then removed and destroyed. This is called culling. Pitting, these are blood cells which are abnormal as well. They either contain something on the surface of red blood cells, such as a parasite or a granule, and these red blood cells are cleaned and then returned back into circulation. So the spleen, you know, as part of the reticular endothelial system, it produces lymphocytes, stores iron, and uh, antibodies. So it's, it's very important, even though you can have a normal life without a spleen. Another important point of the spleen is that storage. So red blood cells are housed and stored within the spleen. And when the body needs it, the smooth muscle walls contract around the spleen and then it then releases the red blood cells in time of need. So in simpler terms, the spleen is involved with defense against disease, removal and destruction of red blood cells, old or diseased, and as well a good source of storage and filtration. Location and size. So the spleen is typically located between the 9th and 11th rib space. It is inferior to the diaphragm, lateral to the stomach, and superior to the left kidney. Generally, spleen size is no greater than 12 centimeters in length and 7 centimeters in the transverse. The superior lateral portion of the spleen has a convex shape, and the inferior medial portion of the spleen has a concave shape. Vascular supply. This part of the lecture is very important because you're going to use your vasculature as landmarks to indicate other organs, find other issues or other processes going on within the abdomen. So the spleen receives its arterial supply via the splenic artery and this originates off of the celiac axis or the celiac trunk. The splenic vein originates from the splenic hilum and this course is medial toward the center of the body, posterior to the pancreatic body and tail. Now the artery and the vein of the spleen display flow patterns similar to other abdominal organs within the body. So your splenic artery, your arterial supply is going to display a 
low resistive type of waveform and your splenic vein is going to display a phasic type of waveform. So here's a nice depiction. This is a transverse image of the pancreas right here in the middle of the screen. So here you have uh, subcutaneous tissue, you have some muscle, as well you have the left lobe of the liver jetting out, and as you go more posterior, you have body of the pancreas, you have splenic vein right along here, you have the SMA and the aorta, and then here's the transverse process, the, the spine back here, or vertebral body. As well you have the IVC here, and then you have the left renal vein coursing in between the aorta and the SMA. So this is important because you imagine the spleen is here to the patient's left, splenic vein courses medial, posterior to the pancreatic tail, pancreatic body, and then forms the confluence right here. And this confluence is formed by the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein. And then at this portion, you don't see it, but it heads off into the liver and that's part of the hepatic portal system. So again, just another look. Here you have the abdominal aorta or descending aorta, and your first branch is your celiac trunk. You have your celiac trunk or your celiac access, and this bifurcates into your common hepatic artery and your splenic artery. The splenic artery then courses lateral toward the hilum of the spleen. Then you have at the origin or at the hilum of the spleen, the splenic vein, which then courses posterior to the pancreatic tail and body. It joins the inferior mesenteric vein at this point here and then courses more medial to join the superior mesenteric vein right here. And this forms a confluence. So you're going to use these vascular structures as landmarks to finding the pancreas tail, body, and head. So let's talk about some common indications of why one might perform an ultrasound on the spleen. Most typical ones are obviously abnormal lab results. So you have leukocytosis, which is increased white blood cell production, or leukopenia, decrease white blood cells. You have history of infection, such as tuberculosis, or perhaps you are increased risk for infection, undergoing a patient undergoing chemotherapy or recent shock or trauma. And you have left upper quadrant pain, again, could be uh, originating from trauma, and the palpable abnormality. So those are all very common uh, indications for performing an ultrasound examination of the spleen. Patient position. So there are two main positions. You have the supine and the right lateral decubitus position with the arm raised in both positions, preferably. Right lateral decubitus is ideal, but as some of you know, if you perform a lot of mobile ultrasounds, portable ultrasounds, and you visit the unit, ICU, CCU, a lot of your patients are not going to be able to lay in the right lateral decubitus position. So you can perform an ultrasound examination of the spleen in supine position. Just try to get that left arm up by their head and you'll have clear access. If equal importance is uh, using the breathing technique, if your patient can, definitely ask them to inhale, take a deep inspiration, and to hold it. This will fill the lungs up, push the diaphragm down, and the diaphragm then will push some of the internal organs down. And this will help visualize the left kidney and the spleen a little better. As far as uh, your transducers or your probe selection, the curved or the sector will definitely work depending on which one you have. They both have advantages and disadvantages. The curved has better detailed resolution. It just has a tougher time of getting in between the rib space. The sector probe has less detailed resolution but can get in between the rib space but you lose a little more of your near field. So you have to weigh the pros and cons of uh, choosing your transducer at that point. So your scanning technique. Uh, according to the uh, AIUM guidelines, you're going to take representative long axis views, sagittal, coronal, and transverse views with measurements. 
as well, you're going to include images of the splenic hilum. You want to then, of course, while you're there, compare the echogenicity between the renal cortex, the left renal cortex, and the splenic hilum. You want to evaluate as well the left pleural space. Make sure there isn't any left pleural effusion. At this point, you may also interrogate with Doppler. Try to find out the direction of flow. In evaluating the spleen, the normal spleen is generally no greater than 12 centimeters in the long axis and seven centimeters in the transverse axis. And here's an example of two images of the spleen. You have your uh, sagittal coronal axis here, and you have your transverse. So you would measure from superior to inferior along this axis here of the spleen, and then your transverse is hilum here to the back border of the spleen right here at the diaphragm. So now let's get into some common abnormalities within the spleen. Splenomegaly, generally the most common abnormality that you're going to come across. Generally uh, greater than 12 centimeters from superior to inferior surface. The spleen can sometimes be mistaken for the left lobe of the liver because it can grow so large it can actually grow medial and encroach on the left lobe of the liver and push it out of the way. And other common reasons for splenomegaly, recent trauma obviously, congestive such as uh, portal hypertension, infiltrative issues such as Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma may lead to splenomegaly. Hematoma. Again, this is caused by a, a blunt trauma or perhaps even a coagulation disorder. You have a rupture within the spleen and you see the rupture right here. And the rupture, depending on the state, whether uh, it is acute or chronic, under ultrasound it can appear as uh, anywhere from isoechoic to echogenic. So it just depends on the state from acute to chronic. Large amount of trauma can also displace abdominal fluid within the peritoneal cavity. Calcifications. This is generally a diffuse change seen within the spleen. There are echogenic foci that are seen all around the spleen. And uh, again, it's generally diffuse. So you don't usually see like one or two, you see multiple echogenic foci scattered throughout the spleen. And this can be a result of histoplasmosis or tuberculosis, some type of an infection. Abscesses. You have a wide range of abscesses within the body, especially located within the spleen. They're usually multiple in nature. And they can range from anechoic with uh, well-defined walls to echo-filled, septate, or even uh, air-filled. And this is, again, caused by an infectious process. You also have hypochoic nodules. They can appear irregular and multiple. They can also be uh, formed because of an infiltrative process, again, such as Hodgkin's or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, perhaps a process of metastasis. And they can even present as hemangiomas. So splenic cysts. Typical definition of a cyst is it's going to be fluid-filled, anechoic, you're going to have well-defined thin walls, and there's going to be uh, through transmission or enhanced transmission. Now, these cysts can be congenital, which may be epithelial in nature. The most common benign cyst of the spleen is the hydatid cyst. Then we have infarct of the spleen. Infarcts are uh, generally well demarcated. They have a wedge shape or may be round in nature. They can be hypochoic or hyperechoic. These can be caused from leukemia, again, lymphoma, or other infiltrative processes. Accessory spleen. So this is not really an abnormality. It's more of a variant, but up to about 10% of the population has accessory spleen. And they're generally located right near the hilum of the spleen. And they are islands of tissue. It's splenic tissue that mimics the spleen. And generally, you find more than one. You usually find them in a cluster of two or three. 
as you can see here, these two nice little accessory spleens seen right here by the hilum. So I just wanted to share um, one of my favorite quotes. This is by John Lennon, and I'll, I'll go ahead and let you read this. I hope uh, Gulf Coast will be able to um, help you today and uh, accentuate your scanning skills and uh, get you on the road to incorporate those into your clinical setting.